they don't have machines, they don't have heavy equipment, you know, they don't have power plants and things like that. But that may be completely wrong. And there's right. the evidence is there that in ancient times they had electricity, they had batteries. Well, Look at the they Baghdad had, battery. Yeah. Uh, I, they had batteries? Picture this. A clay jar, barely taller than your smartphone, sitting in a dusty storage basement in Baghdad in 1936. To most eyes, it's just another ancient pot. But inside, a copper cylinder, an iron rod, and the promise of something that could rewrite everything we think we know about ancient technology. The Baghdad battery was discovered in ancient Iraq. Scholars today say there's no way that ancient man was using electricity or light bulbs. So they look at this Baghdad battery and there's about a dozen of them that have been found in Iraq. They call it the Baghdad battery. And here's the thing. It's been driving scientists, archeologists, and skeptics completely mad for nearly 90 years. Some say it proves that ancient civilizations were tapping into electricity 2,000 years before Alessandro Volta supposedly invented the battery. Others dismiss it as nothing more than a jar for storing scrolls. And then there are those who think it might have been used for ancient medicine, electroplating gold, or even ritual magic. The truth, nobody really knows. And that's what makes this mystery so irresistible. You've probably heard bits and pieces about this artifact before, maybe on some late-night documentary or a YouTube rabbit hole. But today, we're going deep. We're peeling back every layer of this ancient enigma to understand what it really is, what it could have been used for, and why, after all these years, it still sparks such heated debate. So before we jump into theories about ancient electricians or lost technologies, there's something crucial you need to understand first where this thing actually came from, and what makes it so special. Let's travel back to 1936. Workers are busy digging near Baghdad, constructing a railway line through the ancient village of Kujut Rabu. They're not looking for treasure. They're not even thinking about history. They're just doing their jobs. But then something unusual starts turning up in the excavated earth. Clay jars, peculiar ones, filled with what looks like corroded metal parts. These artifacts eventually make their way to the National Museum of Iraq, where they sit, catalogued but largely ignored. Just another box of old pottery in a building full of them. Enter Wilhelm Koenig. He's an Austrian archaeologist and painter, working as an assistant at the museum during the 1930s. Koenig isn't your typical dusty academic. He's curious, observant, and willing to entertain ideas that others might dismiss. In 1938, during an excavation near modern-day Baghdad, a strange object was unearthed that looked simple enough. A clay jar about the size of a hand with a copper cylinder and an iron rod inside. But when German archaeologist Wilhelm Koenig examined it closely, he made a claim that shocked the academic world. This object, now famously known as the Baghdad battery, might have been used to produce electricity nearly 2,000 years ago. Think about that for a second. Electricity in the ancient world, before the Roman Empire fell, before the Middle Ages, before anything we associate with modern science. It's the kind of claim that makes people either laugh out loud or lean in closer. Koenig did the latter. The Babylon battery, estimated to be more than 2,000 years old, is a modest artifact, standing just 14 centimeters, 5.5 inches tall, featuring a clay jar with a copper cylinder inside, which houses an iron rod secured by bitumen a natural asphalt often used as a sealant in ancient times. When filled with an acidic liquid, like vinegar or lemon juice, the artifact can generate a small electric current, and its design closely resembles that of a modern galvanic cell, where the copper and iron act as electrodes and the acidic liquid functions as the electrolyte. Now, Koenig didn't just stumble upon this one jar. Similar vessels had been excavated at Seleucia in 1930 under the archaeological direction of Leroy Waterman, University of Michigan. Four clay vessels, all common unglazed ceramic, sealed with bitumen stoppers, and between six and eight inches tall, with three of these finds lying horizontal, held in place by metal rods that were six to ten inches long. One iron rod per jar, and the rest bronze. So this wasn't a one-off oddity. Multiple examples existed. That made it harder to ignore. But here's where things get messy. The exact details of the discovery are frustratingly vague. It is generally accepted that the Wilhelm Koenig battery was found in what is now the locality of Kujut Rabu in the Iraqi capital of Baghdad. 
However, like much about this artifact, the details are unclear. Some think Koenig unearthed it on an excavation in 1936, others that he found it in 1938 in the basement of Iraq's National Museum. What we do know for certain is that it came from the region near Ctesiphon, an ancient city that served as the capital for both the Parthian and later Sasanian empires. So how old is this thing? That's another debate. Ctesiphon was capital of both the Parthian and Sasanian Iranian empires, and while Koenig believed it to be a Parthian battery, dating it somewhere between 150 BC and 223 AD, more recent archaeologists have determined it to be Sasanian, 224, 650 AD. Either way, we're talking about an object that predates modern electrical science by well over a millennium. Koenig formally published his theory in 1938 in a German journal called Forschungen und Fortschritte, under the title A Galvanic Element from the Parthian Period. Notice the question mark. Even Koenig wasn't completely certain, but he had enough confidence to suggest that this artifact, this innocent-looking clay pot, might have been used to generate electricity, possibly for electroplating precious metals like gold onto silver objects. The story begins in 1936, in the area of Kujut Rabu, near modern-day Baghdad, where workers excavating an ancient village stumbled upon a collection of unusual clay jars. Among them was one that would later be recognized for its peculiar design. A five-inch tall terracotta pot with a stopper made of asphalt, a copper cylinder inside, and a corroded iron rod embedded in the center. The find was catalogued and stored, largely unnoticed, until it came to the attention of Wilhelm Koenig, the then director of the National Museum of Iraq, a trained archaeologist with an interest in ancient technology who examined the artifact closely and was struck by its design. Noting the copper cylinder had been soldered with a lead-tin alloy and the corrosion on the inner iron rod was consistent with exposure to an acidic solution, leading him to wonder, could this object be a primitive battery? That question has haunted academia ever since, and the reason it's haunted them is simple. If Koenig was right, then everything we thought we knew about the timeline of human technological development might be wrong. But if he was wrong, if this was just a jar for storing scrolls or some mundane household item, then why does it look so much like a battery? Why does it work like one when you recreate it in a lab? The discovery of the Baghdad battery didn't just raise questions about one object. It challenged the entire ignorance paradigm of ancient civilizations. When the electric Baghdad battery was first discovered, the find wasn't readily shared because the unusual artifact didn't fit the ignorance paradigm of ancient civilizations. But as continued Parthian excavations uncovered more batteries, the curious phenomenon persisted. And here's the uncomfortable truth that many scholars don't like to admit. We've consistently underestimated ancient peoples. We've assumed that because they didn't have microchips and factories, they couldn't have understood complex principles of chemistry, physics, or engineering. But the Baghdad battery suggests otherwise. It whispers a possibility that's both thrilling and unsettling, that maybe, just maybe, our ancestors were far more ingenious than we've given them credit for. And that's exactly why this discovery changed everything. It forced us to ask, what else have we missed? What other technologies did ancient civilizations develop that we've simply failed to recognize or have been lost to time? The science behind the mystery. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty. If you're going to call something a battery, it better actually work like a battery. So does it. The short answer, yes, sort of. The long answer, that's where things get fascinating and complicated. The artifact had the two metals with different electro potentials, which together with an electrolyte are the main components required to make a battery. And in support of this, there is evidence that an ionic solution, an electrolyte, might have been present in the jar, as tests on the corrosion on the item indicates that it probably once contained something like vinegar or wine. And whatever the case, it is true that the Baghdad battery, as described, can conduct electricity with the addition of such a solution, around a volt or so of it, and had there been wires involved, the voltage could have been much higher. So yes, technically the Baghdad battery can generate electricity. But before you imagine ancient Mesopotamians charging their iPhones, let's pump the brakes. We're talking about a measly one to two volts here. That's barely enough to make a tiny LED flicker, let alone power anything substantial. 
For context, a modern AA battery produces 1.5 volts. So we're in the same ballpark, but we're also talking about a device that's incredibly inefficient, fragile, and would require constant maintenance. Modern scientists haven't just theorized about this, they've actually built replicas. It is related to some conspiracies, but it actually could be what people claim that it is. Subsequent reconstructions of the Baghdad battery have proven the concept. When built using comparable materials and filled with acidic liquids, the device produces between 0.5 and 1.5 volts, enough to cause a tingle or power a very small device. In 2005, the TV show Mythbusters got in on the action. The build team made 10 handmade replica terracotta jars fitted to act as batteries, using lemon juice as the electrolyte. And with all 10 connected in series, the battery produced 4.33 volts of electricity. When linked in series, the 10 cells had sufficient power to visibly electroplate a small copper token with zinc when left overnight, and five were sufficient to deliver a painful current through acupuncture-type needles stuck in the skin, but 10 were not enough to deliver an electric shock to dry skin. So it works. That much is undeniable. But here's the problem. Just because something can work as a battery doesn't mean it was used as a battery. And that's the trap that a lot of enthusiastic pseudo-archaeologists fall into. They see functionality and assume intent. But archaeologists need more than that. They need context. They need evidence of use. They need supporting artifacts, like wires or tools or other objects that show a clear technological system in place. And that's where the Baghdad battery falls apart. Archaeologist Ken Feeder commented on the show noting that no archaeological evidence has been found either for connections between the jars, which would have been necessary to produce the required voltage, or for their use for electroplating. Think about that. If these jars were part of a widespread technology, if they were genuinely used to generate electricity for practical purposes, where are the other pieces? Where are the connectors? Where are the objects that were supposedly electroplated? Where are the instructions, the diagrams, the written records? They don't exist. At least none have been found. And that's a huge red flag for mainstream archaeologists. One of the biggest challenges in understanding the Baghdad battery is the lack of written records. Unlike many ancient inventions, no texts, diagrams or inscriptions describe how or why this object was made. And this absence leaves researchers with nothing but educated guesses. Let's talk about the electroplating theory for a second, because it's the most popular explanation. The idea is that ancient metal workers could have used these batteries to coat cheaper metals with a thin layer of gold or silver, giving them the appearance of solid precious metal. One popular theory suggests the Babylon battery was used for electroplating, coating objects with a thin layer of metal, such as gold or silver, and this idea is supported by the fact that electroplating requires only a small amount of electricity, which the battery could produce, and some researchers have conducted experiments using replicas of the battery to electroplate small objects, proving it is possible. But here's the kicker. Paul Craddock of the British Museum said, the examples we see from this region and era are conventional gold plating and mercury gilding. There's never been any irrefutable evidence to support the electroplating theory. In other words, the ancient objects that Koenig and others thought might have been electroplated, they weren't. Modern archaeologists now generally agree that the objects seen by Koenig were not in fact electroplated at all, but rather fire-gilded using mercury. That's a massive blow to the battery theory. If the whole reason Koenig thought these were batteries was because he saw electroplated artifacts, and those artifacts turn out not to be electroplated at all, then the entire hypothesis starts to crumble. David A. Scott, senior scientist at the Getty Conservation Institute and head of its museum research laboratory writes, there is a natural tendency for writers dealing with chemical technology to envisage these unique ancient objects of 2000 years ago as electroplating accessories. But this is clearly untenable, for there is absolutely no evidence for electroplating in this region at the time. And there are other practical problems. A bitumen seal, being thermoplastic, would be extremely inconvenient for a galvanic cell, which would require frequent topping up of the electrolyte for extended use. And tests run by Emmerich Pastori, 
showed that oxygen was a limiting factor for the cell to function when the electrolyte was water with salt and acetic or citric acids. Sealing the copper cylinders in the way seen in the archaeological finds brought electricity production to a stop at once. So even if you wanted to use this as a battery, the design itself seems counterproductive. You'd have to constantly break the seal, refill it and reseal it. That's not exactly efficient. Emmerich Pastori found that when used as an electrode, an iron rod erodes at the neck, so the tapered shape of the iron nail showed it had not been used as an electrode. That's physical evidence right there in the object itself, suggesting it was not used in the way battery proponents claim. So what does the science actually tell us? It tells us that yes, this object can function as a primitive battery, but it also tells us that it's a terrible design for a battery that there's no supporting evidence it was ever used as one, and that the original reasoning behind the battery hypothesis, electroplated artifacts, doesn't hold up under scrutiny. The alternative theories that won't die. If the Baghdad battery wasn't used for electroplating, then what was it used for? That's the million dollar question, and depending on who you ask, you'll get wildly different answers. Some are rooted in careful scholarship, others veer into the realm of speculation, and a few? Well, they're just plain weird. But let's explore them all, because each theory tells us something about how we interpret ancient technology and our own biases.